So is there a difference with kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God? Yes. Okay, but let's look at uh, probably their strong proof text here. Matthew 4, 17. <clears throat> From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So notice Jesus was saying right here, he was preaching a sermon, you got to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, they assume that the kingdom of heaven is the same as the kingdom of God. There's a small French of weird cults who teach that the kingdom of heaven is the same as the kingdom of God. I don't believe in that. I believe that they're different. So they think kingdom of heaven equals kingdom of God. No, sir. They are uh, definitely different from one another. I'm going to show why. But let's be fair on all sides. Let's, look, let's cover their verses first. So Jesus preached here. His first sermon was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this seems to match up because we're going to look at Mark chapter 1, verse 15. And saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven, or does it say God? God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So notice that Jesus, it looks like that he's preaching from the same sermon here. So Matthew 4 and Mark 1. So because they seem to be the same, same sermon, it must be the same. Now, I beg to differ, okay? First, let me explain the difference, and then after that, explain why Jesus would use them interchangeably. But you should have learned that in my other video, but I guess some people don't want to show that part so that they can fool some people who are watching online. Amen. So just watch my video, Kingdom of Heaven versus Kingdom of God. That should be more than sufficient. But uh, I'll just show you some points right here. First of all, jump to Matthew 11. Matthew 11. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11. Now, once you have Matthew 11, then uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Corinthians chapter 15. Now, you know what the easiest way to debunk this is? Why you're going to admit there is a kingdom of heaven and a separate kingdom, kingdom of God. You know what's going to convince you the most? If you read that Bible many times, then you know this is an undoubtable fact. And you cannot deny this. I don't know how you can deny this. This is the strongest evidence. It's more simple than you think, which, which is why they're going to hate it. This is my crux where I show in dispensationalism in a lot of teachings. You can't deny that God has a physical kingdom and he has a spiritual kingdom. There is absolutely no doubt about that. He has two separate kingdoms, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. What are you going to do about that? There is no doubt throughout the Bible he always had a physical form of kingdom and he also had a spiritual form of kingdom throughout the Bible. What are you going to do about that? Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 11 and then verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, so ever since John the Baptist even till now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth what? Violence. Violence. And the violent what? Take it by force. You think that's going to heaven after you die? No, there's no such thing, okay? In heaven, there's peace. There's no war. It's righteousness. There's no pain. There's no chaos. There's no bloodshed. There's no violence up in heaven. But the thing right here is that there's no doubt that this is referring to a physical earthly kingdom where there's a lot of violence going on. There's no doubt about that. So this kingdom of heaven is no doubt referring to an earthly kingdom. Now remember I talked about a physical kingdom, right? What would fit a physical kingdom right here? Right here, kingdom of heaven. But, if that's not enough, let's jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then verse 50. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll read verse 50. The Bible says right here, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. 
So this is their proof text right here that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So there's no such thing as a physical kingdom. That's the argument. The argument right here that because the Bible says that the kingdom of God, flesh and blood, cannot inherit it, there is no way that this is referring to a physical kingdom to Israel. Now, do you know what the simple debunking to that is? The verse says kingdom of heaven or does it say kingdom of God? It says kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. That's why, obviously, flesh and blood cannot inherit it. Amen. Okay? So, let's put spiritual right here. But let's go to John 3. Oh, by the way, didn't you know so far, excluding Matthew 11, excluding Matthew 11, so far I only used the verses that my critics used. So, it shows that they didn't even pay attention to what they're reading. That shows sloppiness. Amen. That shows sloppiness. Look at John chapter 3. Here's their other verse that they used to prove it. John chapter 3 and verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then notice right here, uh, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Notice uh, verse 7 as well, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Notice to enter into the kingdom of God is through a spiritual birth, born again. So this is all spiritual right here, the kingdom of God. But you can't deny this earthly kingdom that there is no physical kingdom. No, there's no such thing for, as a physical kingdom. Well, what are you going to do about Matthew 11? There's violence going on right there. That's obviously totally different from this one, kingdom of God. We're spiritual. Flesh and blood cannot inherit. But here, so it says flesh and blood cannot inherit, right? But there's much bloodshed right here. Violence, violent taken by force. So you can't equate the two. There's no doubt you have to separate the two. By the way, let me show you another one right here. So the reason why these two have to be distinguished again, the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, this has to be physical, this is spiritual, because what are you going to do about Acts chapter 1? Go to Acts chapter 1. We're going to look at Acts chapter 1. They refuse to teach that the nation of Israel will have a physical kingdom on earth. No, uh, no, 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 no. You're not thinking, okay? Look at Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> now notice what the Bible reads right here. Verse 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time Restore what? The kingdom. Okay, what does that mean? Do you think that's referring to the kingdom of God going to heaven here? Why would the disciples ask about restoring a kingdom again to them unless they didn't have a physical kingdom before? Whether you like it or not, they did have a physical kingdom before. Otherwise, they wouldn't say restore. How can you restore something if it didn't exist before? How can you say again if it didn't exist before? It did. That's obviously not heaven. That's obviously not a spiritual kingdom. Let's keep reading. Restore again the kingdom to what? Israel. See that? They're waiting for that timetable. And then you found out at verse 7, Jesus Christ says it's not for you to know the times and seasons yet. So you see right here, it's not their timetable yet. What kingdom were they talking about in this physical kingdom? If you read your Old Testament, do you know what the, if you read your Old Testament, I'm not even going to turn to the verses because there's too many. All you have to do, if you don't believe me, is read your Old Testament. Majority, majority of your Old Testament is more about God's physical kingdom on earth than your own salvation. That's Didn't you know that? That's right. I don't know if you realize that. That's how many verses you got in your Old Testament. It's always referring to a physical area with the physical nation Jews restoring their people, restoring their land, restoring the worship and the temple, and God ruling on the earth. You don't, is, do you think that's spiritual or do you think that's physical? That's physical right there. Literal physical. Why did Revelation at the end time, it says the kingdoms of this world, see earthly, are now become the kingdoms of our Lord. He's going to rule physically and literally. Now, if you want to deny this and say they're one and the same, then you can be amillennial if you want. You can be Catholic. You can uh, teach that what the kingdom that God has is not literal and physical. It's spiritual. If you want to go that far. 
And that proves right there that they must not be King James only, truly independent, fundamental, literal Bible believers then. They must be Alexandrian metaphorical mentality. So that should tell you that you have to split the kingdoms. There's no doubt about it. God has to have a physical kingdom, and God has to have a spiritual kingdom. But uh, let's close things off. So there's one more proof text that they would want to mention. They like to use Revelation 20 here. So let's jump to Revelation 20. Revelation chapter 20, and then we will read verse 4. Revelation chapter 20, and we will read verse 4. So they would like to say that you cannot enter into this kingdom until after the tribulation when you have your resurrection. That's what they want to say. But you know what? They just dug their own grave. What, what they dug their own grave on is that they admitted that at the end time at the tribulation, there is going to be a physical kingdom on the earth. That's what they admitted. Now, I think to be fair on their side, this is what they're trying to think. What they're trying to think is, is that these two kingdoms are one and the same. But it's a literal place. It's not a, it, flesh is not allowed there. If you're spiritually saved, then you can enter. So basically, it's like heaven coming down on earth, literally. So that's how they get around it. So that's how they would get around it and try to argue. But here, so let's look at Revelation chapter 20. To be fair to them, okay? Because I'm trying to be fair. Uh, look at verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had uh, not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Okay, so this is what they argue. Jump to 1 Corinthians 15. Keep your hand there, and then jump to 1 Corinthians 15. So this is how they argue. How they argue is this, is that in Revelation chapter 20, you can't rule in the kingdom until you get resurrected here. Then they're going to use 1 Corinthians 15, where it talks about us saved Christians being resurrected. And thus, when we get resurrected, we're able to rule the kingdom on the earth. Now remember, if you get saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, John chapter 3, you're able to enter into the kingdom of God. So, because we're all saved Christians, we can enter into the kingdom. Hence, we can rule the kingdom at this time, at the millennium. Now, the simple debunking to that is this. The simple debunking to that is, then if you insist that, that this born again has to do with entering into the kingdom of God, when does this kingdom of God start? That's what I would like to ask you. When does it start? You know what's it's starting? It's starting right now. That's what's going on. Jesus says, you cannot see, you cannot enter. He puts that into present tense. If you look at throughout the entire Bible, Paul talks about working in the kingdom of God. There is no doubt that's a spiritual kingdom. Okay, but we got a problem here. Isn't this a future kingdom they're ruling on the earth? See, this kingdom don't start until after the future. See what they're trying to do? They're trying to mix up the kingdom of God, entering into that, with this future kingdom when you get resurrected. But this becomes simplified. You see how complicated that was? Perhaps some of you were already lost. See, that's how confusing their doctrine is. It's that confusing without rightly dividing. Here's a simple answer. The simple answer is, this kingdom of God we can enter because we're saved. It's present tense right now. Not future, it's present tense. Why? Because it's spiritual. We're saved. But this kingdom at Revelation chapter 20 is in the future they're going to rule on the earth. Why? Because it's not the same kingdom, kingdom of God. Remember, this is now. This one is future. So what kind of future kingdom is it talking about? You don't want to say it, do you? This makes sense. That's why it makes sense with Acts chapter 1. When are you going to restore again the kingdom to Israel? And when does Israel get restored? At the future millennium. Why do you say that, Pastor? Well, keep your hand at 1 Corinthians 15. For some of you who don't know, 
Let's just uh, satisfy your curiosity by going Romans 11, shall we? Let's satisfy your curiosity by going Romans 11. And then we'll look at verse 25, Romans 11, 25. Notice God comes down on the earth physically, literally, and rules for them. Romans 11, 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. So look at that. God is coming down on the earth to Israel, and he's going to give a national cleansing and clean them up, forgive them of their sins. That is not our salvation. This salvation is totally different. This salvation is a national cleansing. You notice that? It mentions when I shall take away ungodliness from Jacob. And it's a future tense. Obviously, our salvation is not something where we're waiting for the future, for God to return on the earth. Our salvation is right now, like Jesus said at John 3, you must be born again, right now, present tense. But this one, this taking away of cleansing of sins, it doesn't happen then and there, it's future. Thus, whether you like it or not, there's a difference here of a national salvation and an individual spiritual salvation, whether you like it or not. Amen. Otherwise, I don't know how you're going to explain that. If you would like, some of these people will like to say that um, verse 26 is Israel. Uh, Israel is referring to Christians. That's what they would like to say. But that's not going to work when you look at verse 28. As concerning the gospel, they are what? Okay, so it doesn't make sense Christians are your enemies in the gospel. It makes more sense. It's a physical nation of Israel. And it is very true. Isn't the nation of Israel today very close-hearted to the gospel? Yeah, they're very hard to win to Jesus Christ. You can win a Muslim to Christ more easily than a Jew. I don't know if you knew that. They're the hardest people to win to Jesus Christ, actually. They're very hard. Uh, let's see right here. Uh, but as touching the election. Oh, but on the other hand, as concerning election. Oh, then they're the elect then? As touching the election, they are what? Love. Beloved for whose sakes? Father. Fa forefathers, plural. You see that? The forefathers behind them. This is physical national Israel, whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not, that is referring to physical national Israel. Now, they would like to say that in this resurrection, it's talking about Christians entering and ruling a physical kingdom on the earth. Now, this simple debunking to that was, I already told you, this kingdom of God that we're in is already present tense. But guess what? Not only do we have a spiritual kingdom that we have right now, sometime in the future, we're going to rule on a physical kingdom on the earth as well. There's your answer. So these guys, they don't jump ahead. They don't look at scripture with scripture. These guys go all over. They insist that the resurrection at 1 Corinthians 15 is a first resurrection after the tribulation. Hence, you cannot have a resurrection before the tribulation. You cannot have a rapture before the tribulation. That's their argument. Well, I beg to differ. The Bible, yes, it says first resurrection, but you don't believe that because Matthew 27 there were saints resurrected. What do you think that was? Oh, yeah. That's it. What are you going uh, to do with Lazarus? Jesus Christ resurrected Lazarus. He said, I am the resurrection and the life, and he resurrected Lazarus. You think that was the first resurrection or <laughs> minus two resurrection, then we go to minus one, then zero, and then finally we hit the first resurrection? That doesn't make sense, does it? No, that's totally ridiculous. It's nonsense. Why did God say first and second resurrection? Very simple because it's talking about a context of Revelation 20. The first resurrection we're going to have here at this millennium is going to be the tribulation saints. Then the second one after that will be lost people at the great white throne judgment. That's very simple. Obviously, he did not mean this is the very first resurrection ever in occurrence throughout the whole Bible. Obviously not. Okay? They failed to read the context here. It's like I said, you know, the first person to walk in this room will get a candy, you know? Do I mean the first person that walked in this room throughout history? 
No, that'd be quite a problem for me. I'm talking about at this context, this situation now, what's going on. That's the same thing with Revelation 20. This is the first resurrection. This is the second resurrection. The context of the situation right now while we have our physical kingdom on the earth. There's your simple answer. By the way, they jumped to 1 Corinthians 15, right? We're not going to turn there, but 1 Corinthians 15, I already gave the answer. Uh, you know what? We'll do it here. I was going to do one more teaching, but we'll skip that one for tonight. I mean, not tonight, today. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 15. Let's close it here. 1 Corinthians 15. So their argument is this is a first resurrection. And they think this is the first resurrection throughout all of biblical history. Ah, eh, wrong, okay? It's totally wrong. Well, it's the first resurrection of saints. Ah, eh, wrong too. Because Matthew 27, there's your first resurrection of saints. When Jesus resurrected, the Bible says the bodies of the saints opened up and they resurrected. So what are you going to do about that one? So that doesn't work either. But here's something interesting. They use 1 Corinthians 15 to support Revelation 20. But if they actually read their own proof text, 1 Corinthians 15, it would have totally demolished them. It would have mentioned that there were different stages of resurrection. One with Christ. There's Matthew 27, right? The bodies of the saints arose after his Christ's resurrection. That's what it said. Second is the church. They that are Christ at his coming. And then you got the tribulation saints. And then cometh the end. That's what the verse says. Okay, if you don't believe me, let's read it, huh? 1 Corinthians 15. You got three different resurrections here. The Bible says, verse 21, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the what? Dead. Okay, so this resurrection, in verse 23, But every man in his what? own order see there's a sequence of a resurrection here there's a sequence of a resurrection here what's the first one christ the first fruits one there's your first resurrection right there is christ and if you look at matthew 27 it says the body of the saints arose after his christ resurrection that's why it's interesting the verse says christ the first what fruits plural that's interesting but aside from that let's read the next one Afterward, after that, they that are Christ at his coming. Are you a part of Christ? Aren't you a Christian? Yes, Christian is named after Christ, see? So that's us. There's our resurrection. But after that, verse 24, then cometh the what? And there's your tribulation. They would like to say that this end is referring to the lost people's resurrection. But that's not going to work. The reason why is because of verse 22. This resurrection is only for saved people, yep. not for lost people. For as in Adam all die, lost, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, saved people. So this resurrection is only for saved people. So that argument doesn't work. That verse 24 is talking about the resurrection for lost people after the millennium. Eh, wrong, that ain't gonna work. Besides, if you look up the word end in the Bible, your favorite passage, Matthew 24, you know that verse more than John 3.16. Matthew 24, which talks about the tribulation, what does it call it? End, 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 end. Uh, tell us, what shall uh, be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? He that endureth to the end shall be saved. But the end is not yet. The end of all things is at hand. That's tribulation. So whether you like it or not, this is referring to the tribulation. It was your mistake to critique me online. That was the biggest mistake you made. Yeah. Now you just made me use your own proof text to debunk you. So you got to believe there's no doubt a difference of kingdoms right here. Undoubtable fact. 